with the mission to keep as many men on as many guns for as long as possible. We called him Doc. Welcome to Combat Vet Vision. And now your host, Aaron Chief Seabird. Hey, how's everybody doing? Welcome to Combat Vet Vision. Hey, this is a place where uh, I, I get to come and tell my story. I also get to tell my perspective. I get my guests also, uh, combat veterans, veterans, supporters, volunteers. They get to come on here and tell their story. The reason why they did everything, what they've done, and why they've done it. And, uh, you know, I usually talk about Warrior Built, the PTSD Foundation of America, all these nonprofits that do some really amazing things. Thanks for Sitch Radio for put, producing my show. Today, I have Hiram A. Murray on deck. Just got done doing the movie called Operation Seawolf. He, uh, he has quite a cool story from being a New York police officer during 9-11, his mo motivation to join the Marine Corps as an officer, a captain in the Marine Corps. Uh, with an exit strategy, went to LAPD for a little while, knowing that he was going to be an actor, uh, got into acting. And now he's a full-time actor, so his transition, a lot of his time spent in the Marine Corps was really awesome. And uh, he's on deck with me today. So, Hiram, thanks a lot for being here, brother. Uh, thanks, brother. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks a lot for your service, for one. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks a lot for coming and kind of tell your story. And, uh, you know, tell, tell your story. You, you grew up in Brooklyn and why why you ended up wanting to join the marine corps and obviously 911 let's talk a little bit about your thoughts and your process as growing up as a kid to to everything that you went into yeah so um born and raised brooklyn new york um and uh growing up in new york you know greatest city in the world in my opinion <laughs> i'm a little biased obviously um right. i loved it you know and uh i I was, I fell in love with like the whole entertainment industry. You know, I started, um, I started doing like background for like commercials and music videos and stuff like that. And um, I went to film school, I went to college. And while I was in college, I joined NYPD, right? And, you know, while I was in NYPD, you know, 9-11 happened on my watch in my backyard and that, prompted me to put all my dreams and aspirations of the entertainment industry on hold because I wanted to serve my country. Never wanted to be a lifer, wasn't trying to be a general or anything like that. Uh, so when I graduated school, um, I went into the Marine Corps. At the time that I went into the Marine Corps, there were no ground, um, there were no ground slots available. There were only aviation slots available. So I got a pilot contract. So I went into the Marine Corps as a pilot at first. And for those who are going into the Marine Corps as officers, understand something. When you have a pilot contract, you can't compete for any other MOS because you made a promise to the Marine Corps that you're going to flight school. So they rule you out. You cannot compete for anything else. So as an officer, you go to um, the basic school after OCS. Um, so the basic school is a six and a half month course where you learn all your war fighting, you learn all the jobs in the Marine Corps. And then from there, you go on to what's like your, your C schools or whatever. So after that, I went to, um, well, I had some time on my hands. So I, I kind of went to infantry officer course just to kill some time. And then I went to, then I went down to um, Pensacola, Florida, uh, which is flight school. So once I was done in flight school, I went through my initial flight pipeline, you know, and I, I was flying T-34s, which are training jets. And once I was done with that initial flight line, then they gave me the opportunity to bow out and compete for another MOS. However, the Marine Corps is slick. <laughs> they were like, Hey, while you're waiting for us to open up some more slots for you, why don't you go to MOS, um, AMO school, you know, just so you're just not laying around, just chilling on the beach down in Pensacola, just, you know, not doing anything. So I was like, all right, I'll go to AMO school and just, you know, learn another, you know, have more tools in my, in my tool belt, you know, make me a well-rounded Marine Corps officer, right? Uh, so I went to AMO school, which, you know, it was actually fun, you know, aircraft, AMO, sorry, for those who don't know what AMO stands for, it's Aircraft Maintenance Officer School, right? It has a 6002 uh, MOS designate, designation. 
Um, so I went to a AMO school. I forgot how long it was. Um, but I did that. And when I graduated from it, came back and I was like, hey, so what's up with these uh, other MOSs? Because I wanted to be a ground intelligence officer. And then they were like, well, you know, the Marine Corps just trained you for another MOS. You're gonna you're gonna get stuck with that because we just put all this training into you. So now I'm stuck <laughs> as the designation of an aircraft maintenance officer. So I got sent to um, Cherry Point, North Carolina, Mouse 14. Mouse 14 is the largest air squadron in all of the Marine Corps. Um, we have F4. Oh, at the time because I'm think I think now they're phasing out the, uh, or they have phased out the F-18s and we have the um, F-35. Uh, joint strike fighters. Uh, but at the time that I was in, it was F-18s. We still had Harriers, uh, C-130s. Um, 46s. Well, not because right across yeah, there, right, right, right. River, in, by Camp Lejeune, they had New River. And New River was more of the helos. So you had the 46s and the uh, 53s. But at, at Cherry Point, it was more of the fixed wing uh, aircraft for, for the Marine Corps. Um, so I did that uh, when I first got there. Um, I was a, a GSC, which is like their um, electrical and whatnot officer, and I had 85 Marines under my command. That was that was my first unit, and I did that for a while, and then I became the operations officer of of Mouse 14, which is a major's billet. And I picked that up when I was a first lieutenant because all the other officers in front of me or ahead of me in rank were forward deployed. Um, so that that was actually pretty cool. You know, as a first lieutenant, you taking on a, a, you know, two billets higher than you, two ranks higher than you billet, but it was just me and uh, my colonel. But that kind of screwed me though, in regards to deployments, because at that time I was slated, I must've had like five deployments handed to me because I was slated to be on a pits team and so I went off to train for that. And the PITS team is a police transition team. So I was supposed to go to Afghanistan to train their Afghani police, right? Then at the last second before we deployed, they pulled me off because I was in a critical billet. So as the operations officer uh, of MALS, I had 1,100 Marines under my command. It's just me and the colonel. So I can't leave because there's no one to take over for me. And the colonel is not going to, he has other things to do. He's not going to run the rest of, of, of Mal's. So I get pulled off. Then I got assigned to a MITS team, which is military transition team. Go to Camp Lejeune for a few months, train up with my team. And uh, I was the team leader at the time. And I think it was like a week before we were getting ready to deploy, a captain joins our team. And uh, he was getting ready to pick up uh, Major. And before he can um, get before he can transition to major, he has to have a deployment on his belt. He didn't get a deployment yet, so they put him onto my team. They made him the assistant team leader. I'm I was already in place, ready training with my guys. We're getting ready to go. I'm the team leader. He went and complained to the XO. I was like, "Hey, is a first lieutenant the team leader? I'm a major, and I'm the assistant team leader. That shit ain't gonna fly." Exo calls me in. He's like, "Hey, hire him. Sorry, you know, you know the captain. He wants he wants your spot. You got to go back to Cherry Point, you know." And I'm like, <laughs> "You know," so yank, yank me away from my guys. And I'm like, "All this in training, all this time with my guys, left my family, did all of this, getting ready to go, and then you just pull me and replace me with a guy a week before we go. You you don't even have the training. That's like." That doesn't make any sense just because he he's getting ready to put on, you know, an oak leaf and and like, are, are you kidding me? That, that yeah, that's, you know. that's that's an error in judgment. I hope he didn't get anyone killed. <laughs> oh, you froze. Hey, brother. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, you're there. Good, good. You know, I was on a MIT team as well. And, uh, you know, I, I got to see, you know, these MIT teams, spit teams, pit teams, 
amazing things because they were going to go over there and basically embed themselves in the, in the military to really help the country take over the, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan. These, these teams came up <clears throat> and that was the end stage to us being really successful in what we did and, and went over there and did that. So I know how important that training was to get everybody's job down pat so that you can go yeah. over there and a 10 man team to really be alone and unafraid and go over there and do this thing. And, and, and when they, when, when politics plays a part in that, you worry, you worry. And I mean, I saw when we formed up, we had two guys that immediately went uh, and, and basically one turned in his retirement papers, another one turned in his commission because they already knew the danger. They said, hey, I've already done it, did this, I'm out, I don't want to do it. So we got yeah, some the- replacement, we got some replacement players and I used to call them, the- <laughs> but that's, that's too bad that you got bumped. And you were especially already slotted for a pit and a mid. And that's some in, intense training. That's good stuff, man. I appreciate it. The 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 last one that, that, that I got bumped for for the major, and you talk about dangerous. The reason th- th- this is how dangerous it was, because we would go over there and we would train the Afghanis, right? And so on like their graduation day, there's this like this long road that we would walk um down at, you know, on on graduation day. And it would be the Marines on the right side, Afghani uh, military on the other side. Um, and we would walk down uh, to the ceremony. So the team that I was replacing, the reason why I was going to replace, after we trained them, as we're walking down, the previous team, as we're walking down, th- the Afghanis just turned on us and fired and killed that whole entire team. They already got what they needed. They learned all our techniques you know, they learned everything and they, they just killed the Marines. So it was like, oh, thank you for teaching us all, all our war fighting. You know, we don't need you anymore. And they just turned on the Marines and killed them. So I was going to replace that team. And it's like, you know, so yeah, like was... people are like, you know, other Marines is like, fuck that. I want to go over there and teach them. Why, why, why am I risking my life to go teach these people how to fight? And the moment they learn all our techniques, they just go and use it on us, you know, because, you know, half of these teams were embedded with, you know, fucking ISIS and whatever else. And all, well, it wasn't even ISIS at the time. It was um, Al Qaeda, you know, it, you, you know, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Oh yeah. It's so, crazy. so what did, what did you end up doing? Uh, you know, you obviously, you know, you got, you got, so I, that came, team. So I came back, you know, continued being an operations officer. And then uh, 2000, 2008 rolls around, you know, um, active duty is up and um, MARSOC starts. So um, at the time, General Conway came aboard. Uh, 2008, we got a new co- um, commissioner. I mean, not commandant, sorry, commissioner. Just the police starting to mix up. 2000, 2008, Marine Corps gets a new, a new, a new commandant. Right, uh, General Conway. Yeah, General Conway. Prior to 2008, you know, so we had Marine Corps always had our own special forces, which is Force Recon, right? However, uh, we never messed with the other special forces community. We did our own thing, right? Conway shows up and he's like, "Nope, we gotta learn to play with everyone else." So he creates Marsoc, right? I was a brand new captain, and I went. They they, they recruited me. I went through a past in doc and everything. However, my deployment cycle would have been every other six months. Wife just had a brand new, uh, had our third kid, right? And mama wasn't having it. You know, she was like, I am not, you, you know, your tempo, your op tempo just increased. We just had, we, we just had our third kid and you have an opportunity now to leave active duty. You know, you drop down to the reserves and we we have um, LAPD just joined. Um, LAPD was traveling around to different military installations at the time, and they were recruiting people who had your top secret clearance, your physically fit, stuff like that. So LAPD offered me a job on the spot. So look at it this way. The average civilian at the time, I don't. I, it may be even longer now. I don't know. I don't even know if people want to be cops anymore. The kind of climate that society's in, you know, right now. But at the time, this was in two thousand eight. Yep. It took it took the average citizen about a year and a half to go through the background and investigations process to become a police officer. 
It took me two weekends. Two weekends and they offered me a job because I already had a top secret clearance, all that other stuff. And so my wife was like, hey, we got a job. And then you can always, you know, you said you never wanted to be a lifer, you know, and you want to go back, you want to go to LA and continue your dream, which is to go back to the film industry and whatnot. And as an officer in the Marine Corps, I would say 80% of my time was dealing with my Marines, you know, crap, (laughs) you know, like dealing with, you know, stupid shit, you know. And so she used to, I used to always tell my Marines this, especially those who would do dumb shit or neglect families or, or do anything like that. I would always tell my Marines, the Marine Corps was there before you, the Marine Corps will be there after you. Your family's all that you got. And she sat me down one day and she gave me my same speech that I always give to my Marines. Hey, the Marine Corps was there before you, the Marine Corps will be there after you. Your family's all that you got. Bring your ass on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to go that's great so so i i you know i told marsock thank you for everything i'm out <laughs> you know so i i didn't accept the position and i left active duty i dropped down to the reserves and i'm i left trade point and we moved out here to california and i accepted the position in lapd and i you know i i did LAPD from 08 um, to 2015. Um, I worked out of Mission Division, Van Nuys Division, and I got to North Hollywood. North Hollywood, I worked a uh, special crime task force uh, there, crime suppression task force. And then in 2015, I got to a point in uh, my acting career, while I was still being a police officer, that I didn't need a survival job anymore. You know, my acting took off. And so I resigned from LAPD in 2015. And by the grace of God, I've, you know, just been working nonstop act, acting ever since. And here we are. No, you know, that's a great story. And I, I know, you know, you talked about that you did acting <clears throat> even while you were in New York. Yeah. Um, so you were already kind of kind of in this in this mindset where you had this this exit strategy kind of thing going. But you, it worked out that you were already able to go to LAPD and then there you were and you, and you just went into the acting piece. Now you've done a lot of acting. You, yes. You've been in a lot of different things. Um, you just got done acting in a, in a, in a movie with Dolph Lundgren uh, doing some, some amazing uh, Navy uh, officer stuff. You actually, you know, played the, the, the first black captain of the ship as well as the first uh, black admiral to the United States Navy. Yes. And so, so you you held you held a position where you you, you wanted to 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 live in, live into this role and live up to these expectations and just be this awesome person and um, talk a little bit about that talk about about your acting career and the the, the the shows that really matter to you and the roles that matter to you. So this um, this last project um, was was especially special to me uh, because uh, I play the film is called Operation Seawolf. And the story is about a German. It's it's actually pretty cool because most war films we always see it from the aspect of us, you know, the the, the heroes, the Americans. But this is more from our enemy's point of view, right? And the basis behind that is to show the human commonality, right? The the human aspects that we all go through as human beings. Now. We're not asking you, excuse me, we're not asking you to root for Nazis or anything like that because he's not even a Nazi. He doesn't he doesn't believe in the Nazi propaganda. He's he's a German submarine commander who's loyal to Germany and loyal to his men. And that's 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 something that I liked about the film, because, you know, as an officer in the film and as an officer in real life, you know, you, you are loyal to your country and you're loyal to your men. And you know, as being a military member, it doesn't matter what mission we're given or whatnot. At the end of the day, you know, we care more about the men and women to our left and our, and our right. We can go through hell and back, but as long as we have someone with us, you know, it, it, it makes the, the mission a hell of a lot easier and it gives us something to truly fight for, you know, because, you know, if you're not an officer, officers have, and it even depends, you know, what level of an officer, but officers have macro vision, 
right? Where we get to see the entire battlefield, right? Whereas the enlisted or or like your your privacy and your last corporal, they have the micro vision. They see the individual skirmishes, right? You know, so I may point out like, hey, this is what we need to do in this particular battle plan, but you're not seeing the overall war, right? And you know, at that level, you're more concerned about the men in your squad, right? You you, you don't you oh, yeah. not to that that information, so you don't even know. So that mentality is you know, my guys, my team getting through this battle to live, to fight another day. And that, and that's, that's what the story is about. And it's from his point of view, as well as my point of view. So, you know, that's what I really love about, about the film. But what made it special for me is that on the American side, I portray Samuel L. Gravy Jr. And Samuel L. Gravy Jr. was the first African-American officer in Navy history, who goes on to be the very first African American vice admiral or admiral in Navy history, you know. So here's a man who, if it wasn't for him, there would have been really no black officers in the military, you know, because he he was part of um, what the Navy called the V12 experiment, right? You know, where they let African Americans, oh, well, let, let's see what they can do, you know, and his ship the uh, USS PC-1264 was one of two ships all, predominantly staffed by all African-Americans during World War II, you know, that the Navy said, let's see what they can do. And they knocked it out, the, they knocked it out the park, you know, which allowed other African-Americans to come into the military, other African-Americans to enter into the officer ranks. You know, I remember, and this is kind of a messed up story, but when I was in, when, when I was in OCS, Prior to me going into OCS, I have never seen a black officer. Fun and true fact, every military unit I've ever served in my military career, I've always been the only black officer. Every military unit I've ever been in, I've always been the only black officer, okay? Never seen another black officer in any unit I've ever served except for myself. And it was always weird because when we would get together with other units to do any type of joint strategy or anything like that, you would see all the other white officers come in and they'd be like, hey, how you doing, how you doing? And you're standing there, you're standing there. And then if another black officer walks in from a different you know, unit or whatever, it's like a family reunion. Hey, what's up? Because we're like fucking unicorns, you know? Sorry for my language. We're like unicorns, you know? Hey, no, it's good. <laughs> you, we don't see each other, you know? It, it, it's crazy. So going back, going back to OCS, I had never seen a black officer before. Okay. So I entered the Marine Corps. I'm going through. And look, I expected the Marine Corps to be hell. Okay. We it, it, it's 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 the longest training, it's the hardest training of all the military branches. Okay. And as I'm going through uh one day, I don't even know what I did to a a draw to, to, to draw this attention from these three DIs, but they surrounded me and they had their stogies on and they made a tri a triangle around me and they're just hitting me as I'm standing at attention. They're hitting me with their stoke with the brim of their stogies. And they're like, oh fuck you up. You you're from Brooklyn. You think you're hardcore. I'll fuck you up. Blah, 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 blah. And I almost lost my bearing at the last second. At the last second I almost lost my bearing. And by the grace of God I did it, right? And they walked away, right? And a black gunnery sergeant walks over to me. And he says, recruit Murray, get over here. For candidate Murray, because you're candidates in, 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 in OCS. Candidate Murray, get over here. <clears throat> and he says, look around. And I said, yes, gunnery sergeant. He said, look around. Do you see any black officers? And I said, no, gunnery sergeant. And this was the first time I ever heard this terminology. He says, they don't want you in their good old boys club. I never even heard the good old boys club before. Growing up in Brooklyn, New York, we're surrounded. New York is a melting pot. Every race, every everyone's there. I grew up with Jews, oh, yeah. Puerto Ricans, every. So like, I've, I've never experienced that type of thing before, you know? And he was like, they don't want you in their good old boys club. You know, you, you gotta be twice as good just to be equal and whatnot. And they'll do everything they can to get you out of it. Do not lose your bearing, do not break. And I was like, yes, gunnery sergeant. And if you, I, I should run down to my office real quick and get my <laughs> boot camp picture to show you. But I'm the only, there's there, there, there's there's one other um, 
uh, black Marine in my photo. And that's because he's from Senegal and we had a, a um, what's it? Um, it's like a, a trading, um, I forgot the terminology, but we sent one of our Marines to Africa, to Senegal, and they sent one of their Marines to train with us. So it's just me and him in the picture, <laughs> everyone else. It's just, this is white. Yeah, it's like an inter intermilitary um, uh, so transfer. Mean, transfer, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, amongst countries. Yeah. Amongst countries, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, I've never heard that before, you know? And so, you know, like, but I say all that to say me taking on this role, like that brought back those memories. It, it's like, you know, like this guy was, was that's the story <laughs> I stood on. You know, to get if it wasn't for him, there would have never been a Captain Iron Man Murray, you know. And and another yeah. thing that was special about it is like I got to share that with my son. He plays one of my sailors in, exactly. in, 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 in the movie, you know. So, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a proud moment for me. So I, I just love that, you know. Yeah, and that's uh, that's that's really awesome and, and unique, too. And, you know, as I as I've looked over your, your stories, I've looked pa over your past you know, you're quite a role model. I mean, your, your dad was a role model for you. He served uh, as a police officer too in the New, yeah. New York police, police department. Correct. Correct. And so, you know, you're a role model to a lot of different things. You obviously, you know, filling a role, making this scene, you know, you had the parking space for the, for him too. At the, at yeah. the, you, you trained on, you trained on the ship that he actually served on. Right. Yeah. Uh, what, so was that? What, what ship did you, did you film on? You, you filmed the, on the, uh, the USS Iowa. That's right. Yeah, that's right. He, he was the commanding officer of that ship. It's docked out. Uh, it's docked out of um, San Pedro in, in Los Angeles, and that's where we filmed um, all my all my scenes for the film. And I parked right in his in, in the parking spot. The park spot that they assigned for me to park in had his picture um, in it, 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 right there in the parking spot. It was it was it's crazy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know that's that's kind of a unique deal, and that, and that's and that's a that's a tourist ship. You can go down there and tour. Yeah, you can ship. go down there and get on, and there and get on it. It's like yeah, it's a, it's a historical piece. It's not operational anymore, but uh, yeah, you guys made it look operational in the movie, so that's pretty. <laughs> 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 hey, so you know you got another movie coming up with Dolph Lundgren. You're 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 playing in all these uh these these war movie roles. Another World War II movie, if I'm not another mistaken. Another World War II. So I have I have a long um working relationship with the director of these films, Stephen Luke, and um, great guy, great guy. <clears throat> and uh, we have another film coming out. Um, it will be out February, just in time for Black History Month, and it's about um the 761st. 761st Tank Battalion, uh, nicknamed the Black Panthers. And it's all about the first all African-American tank battalion during World, World War II. And it's called Come Out Fighting. And uh, in that film, Dolph is on, on our side. He, he plays my major in that film. <laughs> it's Dol it, stars my, it stars myself, uh, Dolph Lundgren, Kellen Lutz, Michael Jai White, Tyrese Gibson, you know. So that one, that, that one's, um, that one's really special to me. That that I had I had the most that that probably not not probably I definitely had the most fun in my entire career making that movie. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and you and, and you've done a lot of stuff. I mean, you played on General Hospital. Or, yeah, I, think I was in General Hospital. Yeah, yeah for a couple of years. Yeah, <laughs> and a whole bunch of other cool things. Yeah. Uh, you know, people people can can look you up and they can find you on all kinds of awesome stuff. Um, <clears throat> what's your plans for the future and, you know, what's, what's your biggest challenges and what's, what's your biggest motivations in, in life? You know, I just, my, my whole thing, you know, we have, a, we have a, a saying in the, in, in the military, especially in the Marine Corps, you know, when we like police the area, you always want to leave the place better than you found it. Well, that, that's, that, that, that's my philosophy in life, you know, in, in this industry with the roles that I take on, you know, when it comes to like, uh, especially the representation and whatnot. This industry is full of crap, you know, and stuff like that. And everything I do, film is forever, right? So th this is your legacy, you know? And like you said, you know, people look up to you and stuff like that. And I want to leave this industry and this world one day when God calls me home, I want to leave it better than the way I found it. So you know, the projects I take on, you know, I want it to, to, to have some merit to it. You know, there, there's, there's the three E's when it comes to 
entertainment for for me as an actor you know you want to entertain someone you want to enlighten and you want to educate someone you know because for however long you know i have your attention span whether it's a two-hour movie or half an hour television show you know i want to you know help you because film one of the reasons why i got into this 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 business and why i love this so much is because it's so influential you know when, when you look at Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C. is the seat of power, but Hollywood is truly the seat of influence, you know? Oh, yeah. you pe- pe- People, no matter how bad your day is, when you go to a movie or you sit down and watch a movie, you leave all your cares aside and you dedicate those two hours of your life to whatever's going on. You get lost in that world, okay? And it helps you, you know? It educates you. You know, it relieves the stress. You may watch something and go into it with a preconceived notion about a person, a religion, you know, a place. And then when you watch it, it's like, oh, wait a minute. I never thought about that, you know, or it changes how you feel about a person, a people, a culture, a race. You know, that's that's what I want to do. I want to entertain you, but I also want to educate you and enlighten you. And hopefully, hopefully at the end of the experience, you walk away a better person. So that 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 that's what I want to do with my career. I want to leave a legacy that does all of that. Dang, Iram. You know, that's uh you know, those there's puzzle pieces that I get, these aha moments, and you know, I I I really kinda got one from you right there because really I am entertained by by you know, movies. I, I see movies sometimes um that critics give like these crazy values to, but I find something so valuable in it sometimes because my perspective and you're right. Your perspective can be empowering to yourself. Yeah. You leave there feeling a different outlook on life. And uh, thanks, thanks for sharing that. And and I know, <clears throat> I know you, your veteran community is really big to you. If there's any other communities you want to you want to throw that out to, but I want to say thanks for coming on this show. And obviously, my community is the combat vet community and a whole bunch of other things. You know, uh, family supporters, sponsors, all these different things. But you know. Any, any other shout outs you want to do? Any last thoughts? And uh, and if someone wants to get a hold of you, they can if do someone, it through me. If, yeah, they can do it through you. But um, I'm across all social media at Hire May Murray. You know, I'm I'm very responsive. You know, just send me a message. And if I don't get back to you, it's, you know, because by the grace of God, I'm busy. But I will get back to you. You know, I, you know, I, I, I try to answer every message, you know, and. You know, just be patient and be respectful of my time because I'll be respectful of yours. That's all. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. And hey, I got to put a shout out to Mike DeLeon for getting us together. Yes. Uh, making this happen. Uh, Recon Chief, uh, he's got an organization that's coming up and doing a whole bunch of stuff. But thanks thanks to him. And he's part of the industry, too. He's part of the industry with you and this acting piece. He's Navy Chief, retired, really good buddy of mine, too. So thanks, thanks for that. And thanks for introducing us. Hiram, I appreciate you. If you ever want to come back to my show, I'd really love to have you. Any kind of inspiration that you want to share with anybody, uh, you of got course, some other man. other things you, you, you want to pass on, feel free to do it on this show. Uh, but much love and appreciation. I look forward to seeing what you do. And thanks for being an in, influencer and, a, and 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 somebody who, who we can all look up to. Appreciate thanks, you. Brother. I appreciate you. Hey, this is Aaron Siebert, retired Navy chief. Lucky to be alive after being hit with a mortar round. I get to share some really cool spaces with some really cool people from time to time. And, uh, you know, today was uh, was with Hiram. So appreciate you. Until next time, hey, this is Combat Vet Vision. We'll see you. Strength and honor. Out.